Hello everyone, good, e uh, good morning and welcome to another session of Carwan Online History Festival Season 2. Today I am joined by a special guest, special scholar because he is the one behind my understanding of the British India, the history of British India because I have attended his lectures online. Professor Vinay Lal is a professor of history uh, of you know, an American, Asian American studies at UCLA. He writes widely on the history and culture of colonial and modern India, popular and public culture in India, especially cinema, historiography and the politics of words history, the Indian diaspora, global politics, contemporary American politics, the life and thought of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Hinduism and the politics of knowledge systems. Professor Lal is the author of and editor of 15 books and currently he's working on a book on the novel coronavirus, which will be published later next month by Penn Macmillan. And at present, he's a frequent contributor to the Indian Express and the Economic and Political Weekly Mumbai. So it's, it's a truly an honor to have Professor Lal with us this morning, this evening for him. Welcome to the session, sir, and over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ishan, uh, for uh, the introduction and thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, uh, good morning to all of you in uh, Delhi and elsewhere in India and greetings to everyone else. So um, this talk uh, today uh, is called Catastrophic Death, Plague, Pestilence and Famine in Late Colonial India. Uh, but I should say right at the outset that, uh, the, you know, the portion on famine is really very minimal because I'm really going to be speaking about epidemic death for the most part. But you'll see why towards the end, why a discussion of famine is also, I think, quite important. I and mean, for those of you who've been keeping up with what's been happening, obviously with migrant laborers in India, you know that one of the issues uh, once the first phase of the lockdown was imposed uh, by the prime minister uh, on March 24th, 25th, uh, one of the issues that arose immediately was the question of uh, how are we going to feed all of these people? I mean, the government had that you would have such a large number of people who would be on the move. I'm going to speak about that later on. But then the question is, when they were on the move, uh, how are they going to be fed? You know, and and the uh, International Labor Organization and the WHO, both UN organizations, have suggested that hunger is going to be uh, quite possibly a major global issue arising out of the present pandemic. So there is a relationship between, between even the pandemic and issues of famine and hunger, starvation. Uh, but this is going to be, uh, with respect to what I'm going to speak about, it's going to be not central to the argument uh, uh, for the most part, but there is a larger argument where I'm going to bring in the issue of famine, but largely I'm going to be confined to the question of epidemic death, uh, plagues and so on. But uh, by way of a preface, uh, let me first begin with uh, some other kinds of observations first, all right? And I want to say that it is quite obvious that this presentation has been prompted by what has obviously transpired in the last several months. Uh, since the coronavirus became the only topic of conversation in many ways, and since the virus set out to, if I may put it this way, conquer the world. Um, I would have been happy to speak about the coronavirus uh, and my understanding of some of the socio, cultural, political, ethical, and philosophical uh, issues that arise out of a consideration of the pandemic. Um, but uh, Ishan, who had invited me, uh, and perhaps you know the people he works with, we're keen on having a historical perspective as well. Um, so I'm not really going to speak about the coronavirus pandemic, but I'm happy to entertain questions about it 
uh, after my talk is uh, talk is over. And there will be occasions in between when I will be referring to it because there are many things such as, for example, the Epidemic Diseases Act of February 1897, which the Indian government through an ordinance has now put into effect once again. So this is a piece of legislation that goes back almost 125 years to the, to the colonial period. Um, and the context in which it arose is something that I'm going to be discussing at much greater length uh, shortly. Uh, I'm also, of course, happy to provide that historical perspective because that's what my calling is, uh, at least officially as, a, uh, as a, a historian. And I am finishing up a small book, uh, which should be published by late next month. Uh, on on the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it's a real challenge to do something like that because the terrain is shifting every day, literally, as it were. Um, secondly, I want to add a personal note. The personal note is that, uh, you know, I've been speaking to my mother every day, um, occasionally twice a day uh, from the United States. She lives in Gurgaon. She's in her late 80s. And one of the subjects of our conversation, of course, has been the the pandemic. Uh, and uh, there's obviously concern on my part because she's not able to go anywhere and I'm not able to go there. Uh, and she's in her late 80s. I need not spell out the implications of that, you know. But the reason I mentioned this is simply this, that since we've been talking about it, for the first time, I mean, I'm almost 60 years old. So I've had many conversations with her about her past, about the family and all of that. But for the first time, two months ago, I heard from her that three of my great aunts, that is three sisters of my maternal grandfather had died of the plague about 1900. I never heard this before from her. I mean, I've I've sort of quizzed her. I've sat down with her a number of times. I've done a little, you know, by the way of what you might call oral history, recording conversations with her, trying to understand not only her past and what it was like for her to grow up, to be born in, you know, pre in pre-1947 India, uh, but also to recall my own childhood. So, you know, we have had extensive conversations, but I had never heard this from her before. And, and you know, she just dropped this and she said she had never recalled it. So this is one of the things, of course, were a, a subject for uh, interrogation for everyone is, you know, the um, and how that plays into our understanding of not only what's happening now, but in, into our understanding of events going back to the late 1890s and the first half of the 20th century in colonial India. And thirdly, by way of a preface, before I launch into some more formal substantive remarks, I think I must confess, and, and, I, and I do so without any hesitation, that I think that I was insufficiently attentive to the question of epidemic disease in my own study and in the teaching of Indian history. Now, I've taught Indian history for, for close to three decades. I also teach a course at UCLA on contemporary world history, which is a period from industrial civilization down to the present day. And in those lectures, I have talked a little bit about the so-called Spanish flu. I'm going to speak about it at much greater length in just a few minutes. But the Spanish influenza or the Spanish flu of 1918-20, um, I have mentioned that, but, but more or less in passing. Because what is really quite striking to me now is that once, once COVID-19 became a disease that entered into the pores of society everywhere in the world, that suddenly we all became much more attentive to the whole question of epidemic disease, the place of plague. Yes, I mean, those who are somewhat read and somewhat literate and educated would have heard of the Black Death before, but how many of us had really read about it in any detail? You know, unless you happen to be working on the 14th century in Europe, Europe, right? 
Um, and I say this because I think that that one of the things that this present set of circumstances has done is it's made us aware of a certain sets of issues which I don't think that historians of India have been sufficiently attentive to. I'm I'm well aware of the fact that there are people who are specialized in 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 the study of epidemic disease. And, and in the case of India, there are two or three people who come to mind, but that's a very small number when you think of you know, the enormity of the issues that we're speaking about. Uh, and the specialists I'm talking about, I mean, are people like Ira Klein and I.J. Katanak. Uh, David Arnold, of course, has, has written uh, on, on much of this, but, but he's written on a wide array of subjects and he's probably the only person in, you know, in what was known as the subordinate school uh, of Indian history who really did talk about these kinds of issues. Um, although I think this is a slightly later phase of his work, right? But anyhow, I, I mentioned this only because I, I think it is, it is interesting to what extent I think this has not really entered into what I might call the more general histories um, that we have of India. And, we'll, and, and as you'll see very shortly, this is a question um, uh, that uh, is germane to the understanding of world history uh, as well. So I want to work my way backwards. I mean, the period I'm interested in fundamentally is about 18, late 1860s to 1920. Uh, there will be some reference to the Bengal famine, but only very, very peripherally, the Bengal famine of 1943. Uh, but that's really the period I want to work with because that's a period when we can think about the relationship between epidemic disease, between diseases that are endemic um, in India um, at that time, uh, which included smallpox. As many of you are aware, smallpox was not eradicated uh, until, in fact, about 1980. Uh, that has been unquestionably the most successful campaign which by the WHO, by the World Health Organization. Uh, polio is, is a close second, although polio is not fully eradicated. It is eradicated from India now, but it is, it's not fully eradicated from Nigeria and Pakistan and, and a couple of other places where it has surfaced uh, in, in very recent years, right? Um, so the, the period I'm interested in is when you have endemic disease and epidemic disease and famine, um, and I should put this out uh, straight away. I mean, it didn't really occur to me until I really started looking into these questions very seriously about three. And this is not to say that I hadn't read about famines, especially famine literature I've been familiar with for a long period of time. A, a PhD student of mine actually finished a doctoral dissertation um, um, about 10, 12 years ago. On, on famines in colonial India, and, and one portion of it was dedicated to the question of famine photography, and you're going to see some photographs uh, you know, later on um, uh, in this presentation, all right? But, but uh, what is really striking to my mind, and, and this is what I mean when I wanna put this out before, I want to suggest to you that we are speaking about an excess mortality of approximately, to give a round figure, you know, a clean round figure, if I may put it this way, an excess mortality of close to 100 million lives between 1870 and 1920. What I mean by that, what I mean by excess mortality, very simply is this. So for example, let's, let's take the coronavirus right now. So in New York, for example, you know, uh, at the height of it, Okay, in late March and through the month of April, uh, you had about seven, eight hundred people dying in New York City every day. Uh, in the United States, a peak was about 3,000 deaths every day. Of course, the number of infections is much higher today than it was back then. All right. Um, so we may get a different peak with respect to mortality. Who knows uh, in the weeks ahead? But if when I, what I mean by excess mortality very simply is that if you say that, let's say on March 30th in 2020, you had 3,800 deaths, okay? 
and March 20, 2019 and 2018 and 2017, so take, let's say, five years in the past, you had 800 deaths on the average each year because, because you would have a certain number of deaths in any case every day from whether it's from coronary disease or just old age or diabetes or pneumonia, whatever the case may be. And I'm just giving a random set of number here, you know, okay? And so in this case, the excess mortality would be 3,000. If it was only 800 before in the preceding, on the average preceding four or five years. And so what we're saying is that so, so many number of people in India would die every year on from this period of 1870 to 1920 on account of old age and account of natural death, if I may put it this way. But then if we're looking at excess mortality, we're speaking about death from famine, epidemic disease, cholera, tuberculosis. Right? That's what we're speaking about. And I'm suggesting to you that the number of 100 million, which is absolutely astronomical, is, I think, not at all an exaggerated number. All right. Now, let me work my way backwards. I want to start, I want to first look at 1918 20 to what is called the Spanish influenza, the so called Spanish flu, which has nothing to do with Spain. Let me just mention that right at the outset. Uh, uh, you know, we should always ask what's in a name? What's the politics of a name? Uh, when Trump calls the virus the Wuhan virus or the China virus, uh, or uh, he's even called it the, the Kung flu, you know, he's diabolically clever at these kinds of things, of course, right? Uh, there is, there, th that has implications. For example, in the US, one of the implications, not that, not that only his calling it created this set of circumstances, but one of the implications certainly is that there's been a uh, enormous rise in attacks against the Chinese, what are called hate crimes. Chinese Americans in the United States. So this Spanish flu had nothing to do with Spain at all. It did not originate in Spain. In fact, I mean, it's not certain where it originated, but now the most recent scholarly work in the last 20 years seems to suggest it was an army camp in Kansas, in the United States, in Kansas, from where it actually probably then started migrating, as it were, all right? So why is it called the Spanish flu? It's called the Spanish flu because Spain was neutral in World War I. And as happens in every war, there is propaganda on both sides. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think I need to again spell it out. I mean, you can see very clearly that, that if you look at, for example, what the China and the United, what China and the United States have said, you know, about the origins of this, uh, the Chinese have this was after the Americans had put out the theory that it might have come out of a biological, you know, lab. It might have been created as a form of biological warfare. Um, and I'm not saying that every American subscribed to it, but that's one theory that was put out. Uh, and so the Chinese, in fact, actually argue that it was the Americans who had originated it. So that's what I mean, that, you know, in, in a war, there will be propaganda on both sides. Uh, and it was understood that the most reliable information coming about the about the Spanish influenza was most likely coming out of Spain, which was neutral. So it became identified, the information became identified with Spain and it became known as the Spanish flu. Now, it has also until quite recently, and this is a phenomenally interesting question that I'm going to want you to keep in mind throughout, okay? And that is, it has also been known as the forgotten pandemic. Um, Alfred Crosby, uh, perhaps most famous for his book on the Columbian Exchange, what he was referring to by the Columbian Exchange uh, was what happened when the Europeans arrived in the Americas. Uh, and you know that they brought a whole bunch of old world diseases um, to the new world, uh, which included uh, smallpox and chickenpox, malaria, tuberculosis, typhus, bubonic plague, influenza. All of these were brought from the old world to the new world. From the new world, what went to Europe was syphilis, 
that's a different story. It's outside the purview of my remarks today. But that's the Colombian exchange, fundamentally, that we're really talking about. Now, he also wrote a book. Alfred Crosby also wrote a book, which is called America's Forgotten Pandemic, The Influence of 1918, published by Cambridge University Press. But he's not the only one who has referred to it in these terms. And when he was referring to, to it as a forget, forgotten pandemic, of course, we have to ask, why was it forgotten? Was it really forgotten? It couldn't have been forgotten because of the low mortality. You know, and incidentally, by the way, pandemic is no not necessarily when we characterize an epidemic as a pandemic, it is not a necessary reference to mortality rates. This is a mistaken view. Uh, the H1N1 pandemic of 2009, officially declared a pandemic by WHO, only caused about 9,000 deaths. That's very small. I mean, in a, in a, you know, number of people who die from ordinary flu would be greater. It has to do with the extent, with the geographical extent. Sometimes, of course, the intensification of it may factor into the definition of a pandemic as well. Okay, but in 19, the 1918 pandemic, which lasted until 1920, was estimated by demographers at that time, at that time. So I'm talking about research done in 1921, 22. And remember that, that in India itself, you have a census every 10 years. And the first census after 1918 was 1921, because the previous census was 1911, and then 1931, 1941, and so on. All right. And in the United States, similarly, you have a census every 10 years. Now, in the census reports from most countries, which is one way in which you gather the information, at that time suggested, and of course, there was data coming from hospitals and from numerous other sources, casualties of about 22 million. That figure has now been revised upwards in the last two decades to 50 to 100 million fatalities. Okay, that's a number of people who are estimated to have died from the Spanish influenza. I mean, this is a staggering number. I think all of you would agree. In the United States alone, it killed about 675,000 people. Remember that the number of Americans who were killed in World War I was 116,500. So we're talking about 20% only of the number of people who were killed in the pandemic. The war was not forgotten. You know, all you have to do is read histories of the United States and the 20th century, and you'll certainly see, even though the United States entered that war very late, of course, it, it only entered the war in 1917 and, you know, one year before the war terminated. Um, but the critical thing here is that the question that we want to keep on thinking about is why was that pandemic forgotten? To read uh, Norman Lowe's huge textbook, which has been used widely uh, on world history uh, in the 20th century, it is not even mentioned, actually. It is not even mentioned in that in that work at all, right? It is also puzzling why historical scholarship barely broaches the subject of the course of this Spanish influenza. I'm just going to call it the influenza of 1918 from now in India. No country suffered as much as did India, right? We're talking about roughly 15 to 18 million people who are estimated to have been killed by the influenza in 1918 influenza in India. Uh, and when I give these figures, incidentally, I should make it very clear when I give figures also for famines later on, what we're really speaking about is fatality rates and mortality figures we're talking about from British India. Uh, so if you add the native states, uh, then we're possibly speaking of the upwards of 18, 20, 21 million. If you leave the native states out, then we're speaking about somewhere between 13 to 16, 17 million. All right. The number of people killed in India was twice as many killed in any other country. And the few accounts that we have, 
because we have very, very few accounts of the 1918 influencer. Talk about streets littered with corpses and droves of people moving from one house to another in search of food. There is a recent book that has been written by Laura Spinney, which is somewhat attentive to what happened in India. She has almost a chapter there. But most of the works that have been written on the influence of 1918 have not really talked about what happened in India. And to the best of my knowledge, there is still not a single book dedicated entirely to this subject. When you consider the number of people who are killed, once again, we're speaking about somewhere in the vicinity of 14 to 20 million. So this is the question to which I shall return later. Why is it that the influence of 1918 was forgotten? That it was forgotten, I said to you, cannot be doubted. So if you look at, for example, colonial India, and particularly if you're looking at the 20th century, if you're looking at 20th century, you know, even when they had a law and order problem, as the British called it, which caused 10, 15, 20 deaths, 10, 20, 30 deaths or 500 deaths, what did the British do? They would immediately appoint a committee of inquiry, a commission. Right? I happened to write my doctoral dissertation 30 years ago on on law and order commissions and this form of governmentality in, in, in British India. Now, when something this catastrophic happens, there is no commission. There is nothing of that kind, not even a committee report on what happened in 1918, 1919, 1920, even though this was their favored mode of governmentality, this idea of the, of the committee report or the report of, of the commission. Now, by contrast, when bubonic plague struck India in 1896, and it lingered on for many years. So when, when I refer to the bubonic plague of 1896, it's a shorthand for the plague that started in 1896 and lingered on until about 1910. I mean, it really reduced in intensity, you know, by early 1898, but there were still deaths here and there, and it lingered on for about 10 or 12 years, okay? When this happened in 1898-99, the British produced what is called the Indian Plague Commission Report. It's in five volumes, about 3,000 pages, huge amounts of material. The first four volumes are volumes of evidence where they interview and talk to hundreds of people, government officials, Indian public figures, you know, common people and so on, right? And volume five is the voluminous report of the Plague Commission, but we don't have anything even remotely resembling this for 1918-20, even though the mortality figures for 1918-20 are greater than they are for the bubonic plague, which itself killed some of 10 to 12 million, all right, okay? For 1896, again, for the bomb, for the bubonic plague or the Bombay plague of 1896, we have a photographic record. Okay, we have a photographic record. We'll turn to that in just about 10 minutes or so, just a, a small portions of it. But we don't have any photographs at all. I think there are only about one or two existing photographs, more or less, of 1918, 19. 19, 1920, you know, the consequences of the influencer. All right. Um, if you look at if you look at the work of Chris Penny, who I, in my judgment, has done the most interesting work on on photography in colonial India. I mean, even he doesn't have anything to say really about uh, any of this, you know. All right. OK. So now let me work my way backwards. Let me give you a few more details. And then I'm going to go back to that question because that question has enormously interesting implications. Why was the pandemic of 1918 to 20 forgotten? Okay. If you work your way backwards nine, from the influence of 1918, so how did the influence of 1918 come to India? And most likely from the sea, 
via Bombay, via ports. There are some newspaper accounts of this. Again, not very many. There are some newspaper accounts. For those of you who are history students or faculty, uh, the Times of India um, had coverage of this. It had very extensive coverage of 1896, much more extensive of 1896. And, and all of that is available on ProQuest. So you can access this. And I think I've seen almost all the newspaper articles that may have come out. Uh, on the 1918, 1920, as well as on the 1896, um, you know, uh, uh, um, plague as well. So in 1918, it spreads from Bombay, from the west, and, and then the south to north and east. The initial wave was less ferocious, a milder strain of the virus. The second wave sees it, the peak in September 1918. So it first comes in Bombay about, about June 1918. Um, although the first time they ever talk about it formally is in late September 1918, and then and then Madras about mid October, and it's and then Calcutta it's reached there, and and starts to peak there the first wave in in mid November late November 1918. Um, you have voluntary organizations like the Ramakrishna Mission um, and the Social Service League. Um, also, a number of organizations in places like Pune, which took over the work of supplying food and medicine. There is very little evidence of the Indian state doing anything at all at this time in 1918, 1919. Now, David Arnold says, and I quote here, the plague threatened Europe from Asia, uh, threatened Europe from Asia. The flu spread in the opposite direction from Europe to India. So he's comparing the 1896 to the to the 1918. After the first plague years, the Chastain government was always reluctant about enforcing compulsory measures on the Indian public. So here is referring to the 1896. Now that gives you some indication of why this there might have been no state intervention in 1918, 1919. Uh, believing them counterproductive, he says that these measures and instead look to voluntary measures, including greater reliance on home seclusion and a role for Ayurvedic and Unani practitioners. Um, all right. Now this will become a bit more intelligible to you when I when when shortly I go to the uh, to the 1896 uh, bubonic plague. Um, what we can also say about 1918 is that social distancing was recognized in India as elsewhere as something that could greatly mitigate the effects of the influenza epidemic. By the way, they don't use the phrase social distancing at that time. Uh, they do talk about distancing and they talk about isolation and quarantine and shutting down things. Um, the most interesting example of that, so here I'm moving outside the Indian context, but just to give you some indication of the fact that the idea of social distancing uh, was in fact actually very much prevalent um, and was part of the awareness of what needs to be done in 1918 globally. Uh, so the most famous illustration that has been given very recently and there have been lots of reports about that. Of course, this is more from the American point, of, uh, from the American sort of point of view. But the most famous illustration is the comparison between two cities, uh, both of which were rather more important at that time than they are today. I mean, not that they're inconsequential cities today, uh, but uh, but they were 1918. And here I'm speaking about the cities of St. Louis and and Philadelphia and in St. Louis. Um, the mayor of that city decided that he would shut down everything. So nightclubs, bars, cabaret halls, schools, churches, assembly halls, all of that. All right. All of this was completely shut down. Phil the mayor of Philadelphia decided that he wasn't going to observe anything of that kind. And at the peak, the fatality rate in Philadelphia was five times higher than it was in St. Louis. Right. Um, so there is a scholar who has worked on it, an Indian scholar actually, who, is, who teaches at Michigan State University, who has worked on the 1918 influenza pandemic. And he says, uh, this is Siddharth Chandra, he says, social distancing has been repeatedly recognized as an important way to reduce the impact of the previous epidemics, including the 1918 influenza pandemic. The aim is to dampen the wave of deaths. Uh, the dampen the waves is that you lower the height uh, of the peak and you stretch, stretch the length of the wave. And one of the reasons you want to stretch it is so that it doesn't put enormous pressure on medical services, right? So if too many people are rushing, 
to the hospital all at the same time, then obviously the hospitals will run out of ICUs, uh, you know, beds, ventilators, you know, supplies and so forth, right? So you stretch it out if you can, right? And that's what it means to dampen it, right? Um, so what he's suggesting is that this was actually quite well known in 1918, and there is reason to believe that this was observed in India to some degree as well. Uh, now, he furnishes a lot of, he furnishes some other reasons for why the pandemic weakened as it moved eastward to Calcutta, but but I don't want to really get into that because I want to look at, uh, look at what happens in 1896, make that comparison between 1896 and, and 1918, uh, once again, keeping in mind that when I speak of 1896, I'm referring to, you know, not just what happened in that year, but in subsequent years as well, which were part of the Bombay uh, or bubonic plague. And and when I speak of 1918, I'm referring to the period from 1918 um, to 19, uh, 1920. One of the most striking things, particularly from the vantage point of today, where we know that the coronavirus has accounted for a disproportionately large number of elderly among its victims, right? To a very substantially, the victims are from a elderly age group, okay? In 1918, the group of people who were most affected was between 20 and 40. There has been some speculation. I mean, it's it's we we don't really know that much about it, but there's been some speculation that it spread very quickly in the army. Remember that that World War One is still going on when 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 the pandemic breaks out in 1918, and that you know in the trenches and in you know close quarters, people soldiers got infected much more rapidly. But but we don't really have a complete exhaustive account of why why people why it was relatively the younger group that was affected. Now, let me move backwards, as I said, to the bubonic plague of 1896, okay? But keep in mind that if you look at what's happening in 1918, that one might, one might suppose that the colonial state had abdicated its duties of furnishing at least a rudimentary public health infrastructure. And to some degree, that is unquestionably true. But I want to suggest to you that the picture may be somewhat more complicated, okay? Now, here, as I've already indicated, so I won't rehearse the details, the death toll is immense. We're so speaking about 10 to 12 uh, million. And, and in contrast to 1918-20, this plague is much more, uh, much better documented than the 1918 uh, pandemic. We also have a photographic record, uh, and this photographic record is uh, uh, has been preserved. The archive has been preserved largely uh, by the Wellcome Institute, um, uh, for the history of medicine um, um, uh, in London. And we have obviously the, the five volumes of the Plague Commission report. There are also, by the way, supplementary volumes in another commission, uh, you know, which, 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 which sits uh, uh, several years uh, later. And this commission was extremely diligent uh, in recording, as were other colonial officials, even those who were not part of the commission's uh, you know, um, uh, 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 who didn't come under the purview of the commission that other colonial officials at all diligent in, 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 in recording uh, details about it. So where did this plague come from? There was, a, there was an intense discussion at that time. To cut that discussion short, it's almost certainly the case that this, Okay, there are two competing theories, and it's almost certainly the case that it comes from one of these two sources. One is that it comes into Bombay uh, via soldiers, uh, or via the, the, which is not, you know, the soldiers here is really people coming in from the, you know, it could have been merchants, it could have been other people, traders coming in into Bombay. Um, the other argument is that, you know, the southern slopes of the Himalayas had always been prone to sort of, epidemic diseases, and it may have come there. Because in the plains, there had been no epidemic disease for at least 50 years at that point in time. Okay, now what were the measures that were taken? This is enormously interesting. We know about all of this from the report of the Indian Plague Commission. 
All right, but before I get into the measures, one of the most striking things is you have a massive exodus of people. You know, when the coronavirus, when I say massive exodus people, I'm talking about one half of the population of Bombay left. The city was emptied out. Okay, this is not something, by the way, that is something that happens only in India. You might be thinking about the migrant laborers that you've all, you know, read about um, after uh, the prime minister uh, imposed a lockdown. And then within days, you had, you know, graphic, horrifying images of hundreds of thousands of, you know, millions, millions of migrant laborers who all obviously wanted to leave because they had no, they had no shelter, they had no food, they didn't have any jobs. And, and for those of you know Indian conditions, you know that if you're working at a construction site, you often sleep on the construction site. So if you, if you know, if the if the owner of that of that place where construction is being done locks the gates. Uh, you know, uh, effectively, it means that you don't even have a place to sleep anymore. All right. Uh, and so, you know, but but again, we're not going to get into the details of what really happened in, in India in, in late March and, and and in April. But what I'm same, saying simply is that if there were people in this government who had the habit of reading a little bit and thinking and reflecting, they would have understood that this is going to happen because this has happened time after time. It happened in the Black Death in the 14th century, massive exodus of people, all right? And certainly in 1896, half the city, all the sources agree on that. Even in the newspapers, we talk about it, just left. Within days, the city had been really emptied out. What is interesting, which is not mentioned, Okay, and, and Natasha Sarkar, who has written a doctoral dissertation, is really the first one who really looks at it in some detail, is that there is a bit of an irony there. Well, but the problem here is that one reason why the cities expanded as they did in India, already in the late 19th century this was happening, this would of course happen in the post-47 period, when Delhi, which 1941 census had a population of 400,000, and today has 21 million, that you have a massive expansion of cities in India, okay, post-47 period. And if for those of you interested in the commercial Hindi film, you know that this scene of the migrant, the person who, you know, comes into the city to look for work was a perennial theme in the 50s, 60s, even in the 70s, you know, right? Now, what she points out is that even then you have people leaving between the months of April and June of 1897, about 250 to 300,000 people were trying to come into Bombay from the rural countryside because the countryside was not able to sustain them. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, of course, Indian indentured laborers also left and beginning in the late 1830s and then 1840s, you know, going to Trinidad and, and, and Guyana and, you know, Mauritius and so on and so forth. Uh, for the next several decades, you know, in Fiji much later on, but that's what happened, right? The evacuation of the countryside to a substantial degree, right? So she, she records this phenomenon, but you, but important thing is you have this exodus. Now the 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 report of the commission, report of the Indian Play Commission, describes in substantial detail. I mean, five volumes. You can imagine that the detail is enormous describes in substantial detail many of the measures that were taken to try to bring it under control. Um, and for those of you who don't have the luxury of reading, I've only read very small parts of it, but there is a very good summary uh, of this, which was given in the British Medical Journal in 1904 over successive issues and, 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 and basically six or seven issues of this journal uh, you know, summarize the whole uh, report of the of the of the plague commission. They talk about the measures that were taken to control the plague, um, and they talk about the, the using disinfectants, the use of dry chloride or lime uh, uh, to flush out passages, uh, to flush out sewers, uh, to uh, clean up homes. Uh, sometimes homes were destroyed. Uh, clothes of those who were infected were burnt uh, immediately. Uh, closure of grain stores. Uh, a little footnote here. The first place where the plague appears 
in a village or a town when you when when it first appears as it spreads is guess where the shopkeeper because that's where rats are likely to appear and there's a very interesting literature which i wasn't aware of which is a use of cats as preventive measures for plague i mean there's there're like eight or 10 articles on that in medical medical journals all of which agreed that villages that had a larger number of cats were generally free of the plague so it's, many of them argued that the simplest way to take care of this problem was to actually make sure that each village had a supply of cats you know all right there's a very interesting article written by a man called Buchanan which i'm going to which i'm going to go back to in just a minute or two because what you see also in that piece is you see a much more detailed sociology of knowledge um in in uh, colonial um uh, india you know all right um and then you had quarantine and isolation and you had search parties so the search parties were and this is what this is where the indian epidemic uh the epidemic diseases act of february 1897 comes in so this was an act that was passed um uh and which was then invoked as i said in my opening remarks a, a little while ago invoked by the indian government when it passed an ordinance um in march to bring this act uh, back into into consideration of course portions of it have been entirely revised so if you look at the act now um as it appears on the internet there is you can get a pdf of it actually is not the act that was really published back in 1897 because it omits the portions that the government of india has uh, uh, de uh has deleted uh you know and modified uh but uh, among other things the act says for example very clearly so it's a, it's power to take special measures and prescribe regulations as to dangerous epidemic disease so this is section 2 when at any time the state government is satisfied that the state or any part visited or threatened with an outbreak of dangerous epidemic disease and it thinks that the ordinary provisions of law are insufficient it may then take into consideration other considerations which this act empowers them to do and that included the portion that had has been retained in okay by the ordinance of 2020 the inspection of persons traveling by railways or otherwise and the segregation i'm reading it out literally in hospital temporary accommodation or otherwise a person suspected by the inspecting officer of being infected with any such disease now let me translate this into a different language okay in 1897 what colonial officials inferred from the act was that they had the power to undertake search parties okay take that would make that generally meant three officials including at least one british official and they would go and escorted by a bunch of constables and they had the authority to enter into any indian home to see if someone there was being put in hiding because officially you were supposed to reveal that you had the plague as it were that you were infected you were you had the symptoms and then you were supposed to go into quarantine or isolation now the the colonial states view was that we want to ensure that there is compliance with this so this created a huge ruckus and it created a huge ruckus because because lots of indians argued that what the colonial state was really doing was it was using this as a pretext to enter into indian homes and in particular violate the privacy of their women you know of the zenana etc so there's actually a substantial literature there newspaper accounts which very clearly are happening okay so for example there is a newspaper uh, called the hitavadi and it attacks the epidemic diseases act in an article just literally days after okay after the act was passed it says that this act would enable executive officers officers on the merest suspicion to quote snatch away the wife from the husband the daughter from the arms of the mother helpless children from the side of their parents and old parents from the protection of their sons and for those of your students of indian history you are well aware of the fact that one of the consequences of this which i'm not going to talk about 
really except to mention it for those who are not aware of it, that, that the play commissioner in Pune, Rand, William Rand, was going to be assassinated by by two brothers, the Chapeker brothers, who then, of course, become legendary figures. Uh, and this is one of the first acts of political assassination that is carried out um, in what we might characterize as the nationalist period, right? All right, so, so when we are looking at um, the Epidemic Diseases Act, there are obviously political implications of that kind, but the fact that this act was considered to be necessary and that, and that the Indian state today still is working under the purview of this act, I think is not insignificant. Although, of course, I'm sure all of you are aware that the Indian state has today has also summoned a number of other pieces of legislation, not only the Indian, not only the Epidemic Diseases Act. Now, finally, on this question, but before I do that, Ishan, may I ask you to open that PowerPoint um, and share it? Because I want to show five figures, five images, uh, which are from, um, so if we can go to the first slide after this, uh, which are from the Welcome Institute's collection, okay? So uh, these are all, by the way, from Karachi. These photographs were all taken from Karachi, which of course was part of Undivided India now. Uh, and these photographs are all from 1897 from the Welcome Collection. Uh, and this, this uh, uh, shows a quarantine area. This shows a quarantine area. It doesn't, uh, of course, you know, people are not singularly in isolation, but this would have been a large area. And then they actually sort of got everybody together for a group photograph. Somebody would have to really sit down and analyze you know, the whole politics of photographs uh, of this kind as well. But this is a quarantine area uh, during the bubonic plague in 1890 and in 1897. Uh, if we can go to the next one now, um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to show them very quickly here because we because we don't really have time to really ponder uh, over each of these images at any substantial length. Here you have a a, a, a European, a white white doctor who is injecting a curative serum in a big patient. Uh, uh, again, all of these, once again, just let me reiterate, are from are from Karachi, from uh, uh, 1897. And let me reiterate, we have nothing of this kind for 1918 to 20. The influenza of that period. Not a single photograph of this kind or indeed any kind at all. All right. Okay. Next photograph. All right. So this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, people who are doing their laundry, uh, at the Dobi Ghat, um, uh, in Karachi, uh, in the outskirts of Karachi, 18, uh, 1897. Um, and this is all during the, the 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 plague, and Karachi was quite badly hit at this time because remember it started in, as I said, in Bombay, and then it works its way further west and south, and then eventually north and east as well. All right, so if we could have the next image, uh, I only selected five images from this. The Welcome Institute collection has about five hundred images. For those of you who want to look at that, you can easily find it by by googling it. Uh, this is a what you're seeing here. Uh, uh, is a house uh, where people who had been infected with the plague uh, had been living and the house was demolished. Um, and the last image from this series over here. Okay, and, and this uh, I thought was an extraordinary photograph. This is uh, a, a person who is being disinfected. So he's been put in that uh, in that tub, and they are spraying something. The the image doesn't specify what is it, what's being used, uh, whether it's chlorine, for example. Uh, some of you may be aware, incidentally, that when when the whole um, um, set of episodes related to migrant laborers uh, uh, started in late March uh, uh, of this year, uh, when the coronavirus uh, you know pandemic uh, was declared. Uh, uh, so some of you may be aware that one of the most horrifying incidents we read about, and there are a number of number of videos on YouTube that was taken of people who were being hosed down, um, you know, and uh, 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 you know, and, and and again, you know, what exactly the substance was? It wasn't water. It seems it was chlorine, uh, but uh, water with chlorine. Uh, but uh, as a case may be, this whole idea of of disinfecting people like that as though you might be disinfecting 
you know, uh, um, uh, an infected structure, you know, trying to kill rats or mosquitoes or something of that kind. That's what it obviously invokes. Uh, and there are obviously resonances with what the Nazis did when they used, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Zyklon B gas, for example, which was actually an insecticide. It was it was first created as an insecticide, and then it was used, uh, uh, you know, when they decided to start gassing Jews um, at a number of concentration camps. Um, so anyhow, these are the images which which we'll we'll get back to the PowerPoint presentation in just a few minutes as I move quickly to my. Uh, to my uh, conclusion. Uh, Ishan, just let me know because I know that it's already uh, uh, it's already almost in, an hour into, I mean, I think it's about 50 minutes maybe since I started. How much more time do I have? Do you want me to conclude in about 10 minutes or so so that we leave time for uh, questions and answers? I, I can't hear you. Uh, we, can, we can take 10 to 20 minutes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me just take just, let me just take another 10, 15 minutes over here. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you very briefly before I move to the question of famines, and then and then in my conclusion I will move back to that question, which I want to analyze at greater detail. And that question is, uh, why is it that the pandemic of 1918, 20 was forgotten? What are the implications of that, right? Uh, that it appears almost nowhere in the in the visual record in the in the archive. There's no commission report. There's no photographic record, and there's very little scholarly work even today, a hundred years, a hundred years later. But before we move into all of that, so uh, because you know, I think that this material becomes more interesting when you start delving into the whole colonial sociology of knowledge and the colonial politics of knowledge in the characterization of the plague and the measures and the literature. You know, what was the nature of governmentality? What was the kind of discursive formation that they were actually attempting to put into place? So there is an article written by uh, Lieutenant Colonel A. Buchanan. Um, it's called Cats as Plague Preventers. That's the actual title of the piece, uh, published uh, in the British Medical Journal on 30th May 1908. Um, and it, it's, it's a detailed discussion of something I've already hinted at, that is, why not use cats um, to prevent bubonic plague? And, so it, and, then it, and then it gives evidence from a number of different villages, a number of different districts, and points out that colonial officials actually went and made inquiries in a number of different places. And essentially, they were able to establish that as a rule, and I'm quoting as a rule, there was no cat in the houses in which cases of plague occurred. So when, when plague occurs, there are no cats. And of course, the reverse is that when you do have cats, there are there is no plague. Now, you might think to yourself, well, this is all very simple because, for example, there are all kinds of complications that arise. One of the complications was... I don't think that the British had thought through it, and, and they might not have thought through it because they hadn't really tried it before. I mean, that might be one of the simplest reasons for it. But that when you disinfect a house, okay, when you disinfect a house and you try to drive the play, the rats out, or you try to kill them, but if you don't kill them and you get drive them out, what they do is they go to another home, and then they infect that home. So one of the, one of the things they came to the realization was that it wasn't good enough to just disinfect the house. You, you either kill the, you kill the rat or you did nothing. Because if you actually didn't kill the rat, but you disinfected it, you know, left an odor that was unpleasant, for example, or that the cat might die of slow poisoning, you know, and that the cat, the rat would, I mean, the rat might die of slight poisoning, that the rat, if it moves, it's going to, it's going to possibly go into another home, which is not been infected before, all right? Uh, and and the, the, the report comes to all kinds of very interesting conclusions, such as the fact that the reason why, for example, the fatality rate might have been higher in places like the Punjab, okay, is because in the Punjab, farmers were much more likely to sleep alongside their animals, okay? Uh, and the rats were much more likely to be in marts. But if you move to homes in Calcutta, the, the 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 evidence seems to point out 
uh, uh, on the outskirts where people were keeping animals, but 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 the sheds where they were kept were at, at, at a remote distance relatively from the main dwelling, from the main dwelling, that there the rate of infection was substantially lower. But one of the reasons why this article is enormously interesting, it also gets into the it gets into the religious worldview of the Hindus, the Muslims, and the Parsis. So, for example, it points out that Muslims hate dogs. Okay, uh, the Prophet apparently didn't like dogs. All right, and I'm not going to obviously get into that and into the merits of that view or whether whether there is evidence from the Hadiths or from the Quran and all of that. But it what does point out is that look, actually Muslims are relatively fond of cats. So it, it, it suggests that the infection rate among Muslims is considerably lower than it is among Hindus. And it points out that one of the problems um, with the Hindus, and I'll quote it and you'll see exactly what I mean. It says, among the Hindus, the rat is the means of locomotion of the god Ganpati, right? It's his vehicle, right? Okay. And many of them would prefer to run the risk of taking plague rather than kill a cat. The Jains object to taking life of any kind. And then it suggests that, well, that may be one reason why the fatality rate in, in portions of Gujarat, uh, particularly where you have a higher Jain population, is higher. All right. And this is what I mean. I mean, we don't have the luxury of being able to, as I don't have the luxury of being able to go over the whole article in substantial detail with you. But this is what I mean by the colonial sociology of knowledge. There are all kinds of assumptions about Indian society, about the structure of Indian religions, about the relationship of religiosity to everyday life, and so on. All right. Um, and, and he was, by the way, not the only person by, by any means to write on this. There is another person who writes a whole series of articles, about 10 or 15 articles, where he did methodical work over a over a period of several months you know looking at the role of cats in the prevention of bubonic plague all right so now let me go back to the question so why was 1918-20 pandemic the the influenza forgotten notwithstanding the enormous loss of life David Arnold suggests the following. He says that plague was long remembered. So he's referring to the 1896 now, right? 1896 bubonic plague. Perhaps more for the draconian government measures and the upsurge of national resentment it created than for the disease itself. In 1897, by the way, late 1897, 1898, the government, you know, particularly after the assassination of Rand uh, and, and the huge upsurge of unrest decided that they were going to withdraw most of the measures of the Epidemic Diseases Act and, and the search parties also ceased, all right? But the great flu epidemic, Arnold continues, hardly gets remembered at all. We can imagine the suffering of a few, but when we talk of 10 to 12 million deaths, it is hard to begin to imagine what that means. How do 6 million deaths differ from 12 million? It is a problem of numbers. Okay, and how far will human empathy stretch, right? And you know, I would I would uh, recall what uh, to your minds that phrase from T. S. Eliot's Four Quartets from Bert Norton, where he says, "Humankind cannot bear very much reality." Right now, there is a politics of numbers, certainly. Right, I mean, you remember what that that aphorism attributed to. To Joseph Stalin, and it is immaterial whether it's apocryphal or not, because I can clearly envision Stalin believing in something like that, even if he didn't say it. Uh, and that aphorism is where he says the death of one man is a tragedy, the death of millions is a statistic. Right? We just, you know, if you kill millions, you're going to get away with it. If you kill one person, you you might get hooked. You 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 might you might you you might you might get cornered. You know, all right, okay. But it can't simply be, I think, a question of numbers because if you look at the bubonic plague, all right, so the influenza killed perhaps 15 to 20 million, the bubonic plague of 1896 killed 10 to 12 million. I mean, we're talking about massive numbers in either case. One gets remembered, the other doesn't. So I don't think that's a fully satisfactory answer. So we may have to turn to something else, right? 
Now the influenza epidemic of 1918 arrived on India's shores as the Great War, as it's called, a politics to that designation, was drawing to a close. Right? Only a few months were left. Later in 1918, at the end of the war, you would have the Rowlett Committee uh, appointed to investigate into revolutionary and terrorist conspiracies in India. And nationalist activity was going to pick up. I mean, remember just remember that late March, mid late March of 1919, Gandhi is going to issue a call for a national day of prayer and fasting. And then, and then just weeks later, you're going to have the Jallianwala Bagh. You're going to have the incident of the crawling lane. You're going to have the Punjab disturbances. Now you could say that all of this had diverted the attention of the nation. Nationalism was on the upsurge, right? But even this is not fully satisfying. It's not fully satisfying because one would think as an explanation for why it hasn't been remembered, because one would think that logically the nationalists would want to draw attention to what had happened as in the influencer of 1918-19 as an illustration of the gross negligence on the part of the Indian state, right? Because of course, if nationalism is an argument for self-determination and, and saying that the colonial state is not attentive to the needs of its own, of the subjects, of its subjects of Indians here, well, this would be an illustration of that. I mean, and you know, you could make much the same argument apropos of the coronavirus. I mean that, yes, I mean, the spread of it in the United States, I mean, particularly, right, it has to do in part with obviously people taking things into their own hands with having a, enormous decentralization where one mayor and one town, you know, uh, uh, in the same state might, might say very different things. Obviously, it has to do with failures of leadership on the part of Trump and the White House, needless to say. But it has to go beyond that. There is a notion of personal culpability in some cases as well that we really have to think about, right? So the gist of it is that even if one accounts for a number of different considerations, the fact remains that the state was grossly inattentive. And one would think that the nationalists would actually pick on that. So, so it doesn't really, to me, it's not convincing to say that nationalism, in a sense, you know, was really what was on the minds of people just at this particular juncture, and this pandemic then gets forgotten. Now, it may be to move to a different kind of argument. It may be that the war years accompanied by food shortages, inflation, labor unrest, and of course, an armed anti-colonial activity had already inured people, habituated them, acclimatized them to suffering. And I've already alerted you, of course, in substantial detail to what happened in the bubonic plague in 1896. But I want to suggest at this juncture, and this is where I bring famines. I want to suggest at this juncture that we need to, to think of it in a somewhat different framework. 50 years ago, the scholar Ira Klein wrote an article in the Journal of Asian Studies called Death in India, 1871 to 1921. That's what the article is called, Death in India, 1871 to 1921, where he says that those 50 years were a period of unprecedented calamity for Indians. So besides the bubonic plague and besides the the flu, you have a whole series of famines, and you have the multiple scourges of cholera, malaria, smallpox, number of cholera epidemics, smallpox, right? And if you're looking at the timeline of famines, just to mention the major famines that we're really speaking about, post-1857-58 rebellion, so 1860-61, you have a famine in the in in the in the upper Doab, in the Delhi, Agra, Hisar, that area, about two million people die of that. 1865-67, you have one in eastern India, in Orissa, in some portions of Madras and most of Bihar. We're talking about a casualty of about 4.5 to 5 million, including at least a million in Orissa. 
1868-70, Rajputana, princely states, however, largely, 1.5 million. And then the massive famines of the last quarter of the 19th century, 1876-78, Madras and Bombay, five and a half million. You know, and this is not including the native states. And this is the minimum. Now, Mike Davis, who is not a specialist, by the way, on India and Indian history, has nonetheless written what is the most gripping account, in my view. The grip, most gripping account. I think some of the contemporary accounts are very gripping. You know, if you Digby's work, for example. But, but if you're looking at secondary scholarship, uh, Mike Davis's book, Late Victorian Holocaust, which he, where he has, you know, close to 100, 125, 150 pages on the famines, um, uh, I think are very gripping, and, and he uses a wide array of sources, uh, not just not just state documents, but lots of newspapers as well, for example, and and obviously secondary work, uh, largely work emanating more from what we might describe as left historians, given uh, Mike Davis's own uh, predilections, uh, intellectual predilections. But uh, I, I think that he has offered a very extraordinary account of what was really happening and looking at it within the global framework because he has chapters on China and Brazil. And in that sense, it makes makes for an extraordinarily interesting study if you're looking at uh, comparisons with the coronavirus today. Um, all right. 1896-97, uh, another famine in largely Eastern India, but moving into, moving into portions of UP as well, Madras, Bengal, uh, UP, some central provinces, and some portions of the Punjab, the estimates vary from 5 to 16 million of the number of people who were killed. If you look at the Davis book, pages 151 onwards, 151 to about 158, he has a discussion of some of the demography of that as well. And then and then just a few years later, 1899, 1900, uh, Bombay, uh, the central provinces, Berar, you know, the unassigned province districts of Hyderabad state, uh, Ajmer, uh, we're talking about 1.1 to four and a half million people killed. This is estimates from that time. The new estimates at a minimum are three to 10 million. All right. Now, I will not discuss the politics of the famines. I, I have extensive notes and I really wanted to, but I think that I want to leave some time for, for the Q&A. So I want to, in, in closing, um, um, to that question, okay? And want to add one last big consideration, okay? Uh, before I do that, so could we then say that, might we argue that, that given what happened in the last quarter of the 19th century, famine deaths, cholera, tuberculosis, smallpox, all right, all of which you could, designate as excess death okay all right we're not we're not even looking at things like malnutrition and all of that right? because when we speak about famine we're really speaking about starvation death so in a short period of time right? might we argue that what historians have characterized as the pandemic of 1918 20 was experienced by most Indians as something much less than that. That it was, wasn't a pandemic at all for them. For them, it was just another chapter in the sordid saga of death. And one that was scarcely worth recording. Because 1896 is recorded. It's recorded by the state. It's recorded by photographers. But we don't, we, the state doesn't record 1918. We don't have a visual archive. Yes, we have, you know, everyone, everyone refers to one literary text, you know, where there's a little description of bodies floating in the Ganga, but we don't really have anything to go by for the most part. So here's the one final consideration, which is best hinted at by taking a brief look at the work of the highly influential historian, the late C.A. Bailey, Chris Bailey, and in particular, his book, The Birth of the Modern World, 1780 to 1914, which was published by Basil Blackwell in 2004. Now, Bailey is, of course, aware of the role of disease and epidemics in history. 
in the period 1780 to 1820, that short period of about 30, 40 years, he says, and I quote, in parts of the Pacific, the importance of Eurasian diseases by soldiers, seamen, and entrepreneurs scattered far and wide by the world war led to a staggering rate of mortality, which wiped out half the population. All right. So he's aware of what epidemic diseases obviously do. Now, there is no mention of the Bombay plague, but this is not a book on India, so he can be forgiven for that because you're speaking about 10, 12 million. So what is 10, 12 million? You know, people dying. And when you're speaking really about monumental issues and the birth of the modern world, because what is the subject of the book? The book of the, what, and the question is, what is the politics of his periodization, right? Because this period he's looking at, 1780 to 1914, is when the modern world, as the title suggests, came into being. This is when you have new technologies of the state or governmentality. This is when what we might call the administrative state is really born. Of course, one can argue that differently. You know, you read Corrigan and Sayre, the Great Arch, where they say that in the 13th century in England, already you had the rudiments of what you might call the birth of the administrative state. But I think the modern administrative state and most of the world, you can say, dates back to this period that Bailey is really talking about. This was a period that was a heyday of colonialism, the modern world system, the Industrial Revolution transforms agriculture, industry, the face of Europe and the United States is going to be transformed. It's the period of revolutions, not just the French Revolution, but the most significant revolution in many respects in world history, the Haitian Revolution, which brings into being the first free black republic in the world. Right? This is the period of Taylorism, when you move to the late 19th century and the early 20th century and assembly line production. And the conquest of many, though not all, diseases. Right? This is when it's towards the end of this period that the germ theory will begin to replace the miasma theory, okay? or how diseases, influenza, for example, spreads. Right? And remember that it is in 1909 that Paul Ehrlich discovered a chemical which was an effective treatment for syphilis, and this becomes the first antibiotic, 1909. All right. Uh, although he himself, by the way, called it actually chemotherapy, the use of a chemical to treat, treat a disease. Chemotherapy used to refer to treatment, a certain kind of treatment for cancer, usually, right? And this is this is a time when anesthesia, just before, just at the cusp, right about 1900, 1910, when when anesthesia, the use of anesthesia comes into place for surgeries. They did use other things before. They used opium. They used chloroform, uh, nitrous oxide, cocaine. But the first comprehensive textbook on anesthesia is published in 1912. Right, just before the end of the period that Bailey characterizes at 1780 to 1914, right? So what is the significance of this? The significance is this, this. This is what I would like you to think about, and I would like to conclude with this thought. That you see, four years after Bailey's end time, the Spanish influenza arrives. Now this, the influenza of 1918, and it causes an enormous mortality throughout the world, okay? The significance is this, that the greatest conceit we have, and in a sense, it's the conceit which is the underlying theme of the book. The greatest conceit we have is that we are modern and that if we are modern, it means we have conquered disease. This was actually the fundamental meaning of being modern in many ways. You can talk about the birth of subjectivity, all of that. But it's this idea that, well, plague, this is a medieval term. This is what happened in the 14th century. What do we have to do with something called plagues? What do we have anything to do with something called epidemics? Right? And I think that the greatest instantiation of this conceit of 
being modern, that we are modern is this idea that we have conquered these kinds of diseases. And I think this is the real awakening, the real root shock that once again we are getting now as we did in 1918. In other words, that particular framework that Bailey has, nine, where you end the narrative, the birth of the modern, now the modern is an accomplished story. We would have to essentially revisit that whole narrative as well, because what the pandemic today does is it once again unseats this conceit. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, sir, for this very impressive and very interesting lecture. I think this topic was very important to understand the historical context of it because of this ongoing pandemic that we are in between now. And we have to understand what lessons we have to learn from it in the present time. The first question would be that the containment of epidemic do not entirely depend on the government's response to it. It also involves the participation of the people. And so do we get any accounts on the society's response? How did they respond to the pandemic, to the epidemics and the plague and even, you know, the bubonic plague? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, for 1918, the short answer is we don't. We really don't. The, the record is so thin. It's, it's uh, extraordinary how thin the record is. We don't really have much of it. We know that social, I, I actually, I refer to it. We know that social distancing was what we today call social distancing. They, they, they spoke about distancing even then. Um, I don't think they called it social distancing. Uh, and you know that there is an objection to the use of this, particularly in the Indian context, the, the implications can be quite hazardous. Uh, when you already have a large number of people who are being distanced from your worldview and you don't even want to get anywhere close to them. I mean, how many of the domestics who work for people, for middle class families, even sit at the, the dining table ever, never, right? I mean, we all know that scenario. I don't have to go over that, right? So given given uh, what, uh, the uh, given the common sense reading of caste and the caste system and its implications, we know what some of the hazardous implications of social distancing, which maybe, which is one reason why a number of intellectuals um, back in April wrote a letter to uh, to Modi, pointing out that the government should never use that phrase at all. That maybe they should only use physical distancing. But going back to your question, 1918, there is very sketchy that distancing was observed. Okay. Um, but it was not so much as a matter of state protocol, because what I have pointed out in 1918, the state is actually nowhere to be seen. That hmm. is what is really remarkable, as opposed to 1896. Okay, 1896, 97, we're speaking about a very different story. Remember, the Epidemic Diseases Act is early February 1897. There's no such act passed in 1918, of course, right? Okay, in fact, the, gov the government took the lesson that you don't want to intrude into people's lives too much. And this is one reason why it was decided that it was not even going to actually bring the 1897 Act into operation. All right. When you go back to 1896-97, again, there, the, there we have a richer record, but we don't have enough of a record. We do have some of it, very little of it. We don't have enough of a record as to which would indicate how Indians were reacting. So what you have to do, what we have to do is we have to read letters that were written to the Times of India, for example. That's one of the newspapers that you can look at, which is which is widely available. I mean, I've, I've only started looking at all of this about three months ago. So it may well be the case that, for example, the Hindu, but the Hindu is not available on ProQuest and I don't have access to the ar digital archive. It may be that maybe in the Hindu, there were letters as well. It's only when I have access at some point when things open up, uh, you know, let's say in India, uh, either at the Hindu library or at the Murthy or somewhere that one might be able to look at a number of other Indian newspapers. But certainly if you look at the Times of India, which I have looked at, I have written letters, looked at letters, people were well aware of the fact that you should actually practice distancing. And some letters refer 
to the 14th century, astonishingly enough. Okay, so there was some awareness of what had happened during what is called the Black Death, where the idea of quarantine first comes in. The idea of isolation, social isolation, and quarantine comes in. But the question that you're asking, I think the gist of it is, is very pertinent because your suggestion and the question is that this cannot simply be a mandate which comes from the top down. It cannot simply be a mandate of the state. I mean, that's one of the things we're finding in the United States that, you know, the president or the governor may say this or that, but then people simply decide they're going to they're going to decide on their own. Um, and, and I don't want to enter into that question with respect to the U.S. because I have a I have written on this quite extensively and I'm, and I'm writing on this on my, in my book on the coronavirus, which I'm finishing up now, uh, that th th there is a long history of uh, dissent against state mandated actions of this kind in this country. But I think in, in India, uh, if we shift the focus back to India, I think the suggestion that the participation of people, their willingness to enter into it is an important consideration. But then you have to go back to the point I started with when I replied to you, namely that well, we'll have to think through it very carefully because I think you will agree with me, whatever other views you might have, you will agree with me as I suspect most people in, who are listening and will agree that in India, there's already a large number of people that the middle class, for example, or the upper caste do not want to actually have any kind of relationship or proximity to. They don't yeah. want to, to begin with. Okay, so so... And, and and here I'm not even looking at a very rudimentary aspect, which which a number of commentators have pointed out. The point would not be unique to me at all. And that rudimentary aspect is how do you observe social distancing in 90% of the cases in India when you're talking about slums, when you're talking about small apartments where 10 people are sharing an apartment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The similar problems for the working class in the US, which is one reason why the fatality rate for blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans is substantially higher than it is for white people. And when you adjust it for age, it is five times higher. Five times higher. Because if you're looking at how many square feet one black person has in a residence to himself or herself in comparison to a white person, who uses public transportation? Right? Black people. Yeah. Right? All of these considerations would come into play in India as well. And and sometimes in a different way, but they would come into play. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned David Arnold in your lecture, yeah. and uh, it has been propounded by scholars like David Arnold and Michael Foucault that. Under the colonial rule, a medicine and health policies too had become a tool to colonize the society and yeah. land and just the body. How do you yeah. see this comment? Yeah, you know, look, I mean, there is a very substantial literature on this kind of um, notion of biopolitics. Okay, uh, and and um, I mean, uh, it, it is not only Foucault's book on. Um, uh, obviously, things like madness and the prison, but the history of sexuality. Uh, in fact, actually, the idea of governmentality really makes its first appearance, frankly, in this in this way, um, in in volume one of the history of of sexuality. Uh, in general, I am in in general, I would I would uh, uh, agree with with those kinds of observations that have come out of that. Okay, because you see, go, go back to the idea of social distancing. What are the philosophical implications? Because what is Foucault arguing? See, what Foucault is arguing is that beginning in the late 18th century, we move to regimes of self-surveillance. Okay, we kill by kindness. Let me use that phrase as a provocation. We kill by kindness. Okay, And this particular ethos of what I'm going to call management of social issues, which is, by the way, exactly what's happening with the racial issue in America today. Exactly. 
all the corporations coming on board, it doesn't mean anything at all except, except and all the universities giving out statements of we support black lives and this and that. You know, it, just as a matter of ritual protocol, this is what I'm calling the management of racial discourse now at the highest levels. It's This is one way to bury the problem for good. Because what it simply means is you bring in new diversity managers who are now going to talk about race in a certain new language. That's what it really means. This began in the late 18th century, where we begin to survey ourselves. We don't need surveil ourselves. We don't need the state to do it. We become mm -hmm. self-regulating mechanisms. Now, you could say that social distancing is really that. This is one reason why, even though I, my own personal politics is one of complete abhorrence for what Trump and the Republican Party in the US stand for and what the BJP stands for as well in India, that in the US at least, I think some of the dissent has to be viewed in a slightly different register. Okay, It has to be viewed in a slightly different register because we have to understand that some suspicion of the state is critical. It's important. I don't think it's possible to have a healthy society where you don't have a sufficient suspicion of the state. Okay, And I think that some of the dissent has emanated from that. But the whole question of biopolitics, it, it'd be, it, it, I would have to give a much more full-blown answer. But all of these elements would have to be factored in to the question that you had posed. Uh, so this question is about the famine, the Great Bengal famine of 1943-44. Yeah. The, the, Dr. Shashi Tharoor has said that Churchill has as much blood as Hitler does, particularly yeah. the decisions he took you know, during the Great Bengal famine. Yeah. So how do you say this? Because the ships of grain were coming from, the, from Australia. Yeah, to Calcutta, dogged in, you know, dogged in Calcutta, and yeah. were instructed yeah. not to disembark, but to you know say, send it to the UK yes. to feed the yes. Britishers. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. Do you, see I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, the Madhushri Mukherjee wrote a whole book on this. It, it's a book which some scholars think is a little bit extreme, but basically she holds Churchill um, responsible for what she calls genocide. I mean, she's very clear. And this whole argument that, which is an argument that she's not the first person to make that argument. That a number of people had made that argument that even while India was was um, itself undergoing, Bengal was undergoing a famine, that there was an export of, uh, you know, grains, uh, food from India um, to places uh, uh, such as Australia and others where, where it was required for the use of allied war troops, essentially. Okay, uh, I I would lean more on her side, but if this would require a pro protracted discussion of Churchill as well and British policy, and since you have asked that question, I'm going to take the liberty of asking you to go back to that PowerPoint because I had put out some slides. Uh, of the the rest of all the slides are actually a famine, and I want to make one point there, which is a different way to approach the whole issue of famine. It's not about 1943 so much, the point that I want to make, but it's about the discourse on famine, because I think the larger question behind what you're asking has to do with what kind of discourse do we generate about famine. So we're going to go through these very, very quickly, um, because uh, I really want to get to what I would call the main point here about uh, what it is that these uh, images represent. So this is from Digby's history. Digby wrote a whole book, which was very, which was uh, a devastating indictment of uh, British policies and British rule. Uh, no, so the next slides after that. So these are all slides, by the way. This is from, uh, th these are images which have to do with the famines from 18, 1877 and then, uh, and then later on, um, 1898 and 1897-98, uh, and then the last famine of 1900. Uh, this is a family in the Deccan, 1877. Just keep on going on. I'll just read out the captions. Just look at the images very quickly. Uh, they're, 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 they're gruesome, some of them, obviously. Uh, some of the images that we're really talking about. Um, the caption here says that those who get to this stage rarely ever recovered. Okay, uh, This is famine victims of 18. 
77. Uh, this is a map which you will find in the Mike Davis book, uh, the subsequent map, and it shows which areas were severely uh, affected uh, uh, and which uh, areas were less severely affected. This is uh, famine of 1896-97. Uh, next one, please. Um, and, and this uh, image here is um, uh, famine victims in Jabalpur, and now MP. Um, uh, just just look at the look at the images over here, and you, uh, look at the figures, and you'll see. Uh, I mean, it's basically all you're seeing is really bones here. This is during the visit of Lord Elgin in 1897, uh, and this is uh, in the central provinces. A young a young famine victim. Uh, next image, please. Um, and and this image uh, is uh, uh, a young um, 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 boy who had actually been attacked by jackals, according to the caption. Um, okay, and next image. Can we have the next image? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is a 15-year-old girl. Next image, please. Uh, and and this is this is sort of uh, this is uh, an image where you know you have the you have you have the uh, young children who are famine victims, and then the British self-image of themselves as kind of like the conqueror. And if we can look at the next image over here, which is uh, villagers from Rajputana, this is uh, 1899. Uh, I apologize for the poor quality of the, but but they're taken from a book and, and I wasn't able to get a good scanner uh, at the last minute, obviously. Next image, please. Uh, you'll see the point of this in just a moment. If we can just skip over this one. Next one. Um, and, and this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the caption here, by the way, uh, when it was published uh, in a magazine, uh, it said the Gujarati is a soft man. Okay. Uh, so you, you can, you can think, think about that. Uh, yourself reflect on it, um, um, and this is uh, from 18, uh, 1890, 1897, uh, and and this uh, is uh, burning plague victims in Bombay in eighteen ninety eight, uh, and the next image that you see here, by the way, so this uh, Ishan goes back to the question. Next image goes back to the question that uh, when you are in the midst in between famines. Look at what happens. Wheat exports from the central provinces in terms of millions of rupees, 1881 to 1886, a substantial mm. increase, a substantial increase. So this is not simply something that happened in the Bengal famine, then in 1886 to 191, 16.6 .6 million rupees once again, you know, all right? Okay, and then the next image. Uh, so th this is th uh, th uh, this is again from uh, the famine of 1899. Next image. All right. Now, the images you're seeing now, and you'll see the point I'm going to make now. Okay, these are drawn from. London News. The Illustrated London News was a mass circulation periodical. And these are all from 1874 to 1877. Okay, now remember what I had mentioned to you. What I had mentioned to you was a number of famines and one of the one of the principal famines that I talked about was 1876, Madras and Bombay. But you had, you had, you know, they, those are the biggest famines. You know, you have smaller famines where the casualties may be a few hundred thousand. Um, what the this image and the next five six images were trying to do, they were trying to project the idea of village India as a kind of an Arcadian pleasure ground. Okay, life is going on as normal. You have the woman with the matka, you know, all right. You look at this woman with, with the child. I mean, the woman looks well-fed. The child looks almost plump. So this is actually, this. these are all from the illustrated London news. This is a bunia. That's what the caption says, or a grain seller. Okay, and and it says the the caption says the the impending famine in this case. Okay, and then in this next image over here, 
the famine in india it shows bullock carts carrying grain see what what your reader in london or elsewhere in great britain was thinking to himself or herself was life in india goes on as normal there's a rural countryside leisurely pace bullock carts human beings inhabit the landscape under british rule things look peaceful idyllic right you have to contrast these with the images that you saw before okay and this is from the graphic this is a double spread so this was a this was a very large print center fold okay the center fold famine and distribution distribution of relief to the sufferers so my bab you know the british are the my bab they, they you have a family they come they're buying their hands and the british are dispensing foods they're dispensing justice effectively right that's what the image was that was being projected so i think that ishan going back to your question where do i stand on that particular issue i mean it's a long subject for discussion because we'd have to look at some of the particulars of the debate about the 1943 but i think yes there is no question there is british culpability as as i said i'm more on her side um uh, amartya sen who has written on that had had a, had had a, something of a critique where he thought that there was some ele element of exaggeration particularly the role of of churchill because you know is this falling back on sort of like you know the great man theory of history you know one man decided the whole fate and fortune were there free market for example if you go back to the famines of the late 19th century the last quarter of the 20th century what is one of mike davis's fundamental arguments the one of the fundamental arguments is that basically it, it it is the use of free market policies okay the, the the idea that you don't want to regulate anything because the free market will be able to adjudicate this issue as it were okay and 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 and, and uh, you know people like uh, richard temple uh, who was uh, who was a person that, that who has been discussed extensively particularly in relationship to the the uh, famine of 1876 uh, that richard uh, richard temple was someone who more or less uh, subscribed to the kind of views that adam smith had mentioned in the wealth of nations about how do you address a problem of famine all right so i so i think we would have to look at those sets of issues you know yeah uh, so how relevant were such notions as the rights of the people to subsistence Uh, what were the obligations of the rulers to guarantee subsistence in times of need in short was there a moral economy in india and if there was what happened to it oh i mean that, that's a very large question but the simple answer is no i think that the i i i think that the idea of the moral economy as ep thompson had really talked about it in the making of the english working class uh, i i mean the fundamental argument again but you have to remember that this is coming from a school of historians that i agree with but 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 uh, uh, the fundamental argument there has to do with the fact that th that you know when once you have the industrial revolution in in places like britain it really led also to the collapse of the moral economy it's not as though that the pre pre industrial revolution past was no uh, class there was no class conflict or anything of that kind obviously that's not the view that thompson has but what he's saying is that such things as self aggrandizement and greed reach absolutely new levels and and this means that this idea that you are responsible to some degree for the welfare of others in your own community you put a restraint on your own behavior i think that this the argument is disappeared and i think i mean you're seeing that in india of course where i think the rich have completely absorbed themselves completely although i must say that one of the pleasant one of the one of the few pleasant things about what's been happening in the last 3 4 months is and those of you who are in india and been following events very carefully i think you have to, you follow them as i do which is that you have to be, you can't really go out very much that you look at the internet you read the newspapers you talk to people but perhaps you have a different perspective but i think at least there have been a large number of uh, activists and ngos who have tried to step in with food aid in particular uh which is why i don't think that we are seeing massive you know starvation right now as we might have but uh, i would say on the whole 
if you look at the if you look at the middle class and the rich i think it's they have completely absolved themselves of any responsibility at all uh, you know they they opted out except to get subsidies from the state they opted out of the state you know when neoliberalization policy started in india roughly uh, two and a half three decades ago so uh, you know is there any you know, concept of moral economy left answer is no uh, i don't really think so uh, and i don't think certainly that the indian state has done uh, anything that been, that can be called remotely sufficient uh, in this particular case you know uh, i mean we know what measures were taken and we know what percentage of the gdp uh uh you know has been assigned uh you know uh, uh, as a relief package and you know that one of the critiques that has been made is that a large proportion of that had already been assigned in the in the, in the ordinary budget so uh certainly if you're looking at the kind of relief packages that have been passed in some of the social welfare states in Europe what we've done in india is uh, is is a fraction a fraction of that you know yeah Uh, so we'll quickly take two last questions from the audience this is one yeah. by radhika chadha that would you like to comment on prashant kidambi's work on the plague in bombay uh, 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 you, you know look i mean i i've i read that that's not something i've read recently because that work was published some years ago in fact i had i remember um uh, meeting him uh, very briefly about 4 or 5 years ago having a short discussion of that uh, so my answer to that is no i i really can't because i'd have to i'd have to revisit that work much more mu- you know much more carefully now uh, which i haven't done but i'm i'm aware of that work yeah uh, and this question is by om tiwari that was these pandemics especially the bubonic plague of 1890s had some sort of bearing on the revival of indian system of medicine like ayurveda yunani and etc yeah 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 i uh, well yes i think that there is some evidence for that i mean so initially initially the state was completely reluctant to allow indigenous medical systems to weigh in on this because the general view was that this this is all basically humbug yeah these these are not really trained doctors they don't understand the concept of modern medicine they are all quacks basically that was essentially the quackery is what it is that was really the view but when after the resistance to the epidemic diseases act and particularly when it led to such things as a search parties and then the assassination of rand okay and political unrest what the government decided to do was to step back and one of the consequences of stepping back was freeing up the space for ayurveda unani all right it freed up that space and you know it's it's just shortly after that 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 uh, hakim ajmal khan you know after whom the road is named in in delhi ajmal khan road right that people like him start to really become quite important and we have to remember that that gandhi who had a deep suspicion of modern medicine okay because he saw it as fundamentally vivisectionist and he also saw it as a profit making machine uh, he had a much more sympathetic view of the profession of nursing although although he did not follow the textbook principles of nursing necessarily but he was much more sympathetic to nurse as a nurse himself and we have to remember that gandhi actually inaugurated Uh, to be a college he gave the inaugural speech at that college and that that speech is recorded in the collected works of mahatma gandhi it's an extraordinary speech and and he did so partly because because by that time unani ayurveda and homeopathy as well which is not indigenous of course although now most of us think of it as purely indigenous because homeopathy comes from germany but but it became much more widely used in india Uh, and and most people are not aware of the fact that circa 1900 it was the most widely system used of medicine in the united states before the american medical association drove it completely underground okay uh, there's a wonderful book by paul star on the professionalization of american medicine and how all the homeopathic doctors were completely rubbished by the by the medical association and by the pharmaceutical industry because they realized that there's no money to be made comparatively speaking uh in homeopathy as opposed to allopathic medicine so 
if the answer to that question is yes. I, I think that if one is looking at the revival of indigenous uh, medical practices and systems, I think the 18, late 1897 is the turning point for that. Yeah. So, so thank you, Professor Lal, for this wonderful lecture and this wonderful conversation. It was highly, you know, uh, insightful and very detailed. And it, it gave us an idea of how, you know, plague and you know, epidemics were tackled in history and how we are tackling it right now, what we can learn and what we should learn at this time. Uh, so my pleasure to end, yeah to end this uh, we i think i should say what yuval harari has recently remarked that many short term emergency measures will become a fixture of life that is the nature of emergencies they fast forward historical processes in the journey of fighting a pandemic the government have to learn a lesson from our colonial predecessors that the government cannot leave behind any group, especially the backward sections of a society in the fight. So thank you very much, sir. And it was truly an honor to host you this morning. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.